We, uh, we conclude our series on the pursuit of happiness. We sort of finish up this morning, and I want to thank everyone that sort of followed along. Those that adjusted your schedules a bit uh, just to, to be here or went out of your way to find the outline that you missed or the message that you missed, those that learned something along the way, uh, those of you who encouraged each other and encouraged me, um, I have learned in 13, 14 years of ministry, uh, this is the series I, that I've learned the most from. So I thank you for your encouragement and for the encouragement you gave one another. Um, for those who followed along with the, uh, the outlines and the cards, uh, this is probably the most amount of responses I've had from anything I've ever done in 14 years, these have been extremely helpful for you, especially in a learning sermon series. So when you're, when you're preaching uh, is, a, is a bit more for the learning, the learning or the learner, uh, these outlines seem to come in very handy. Well, and I appreciate it. I mean, I appreciate your support and the fact that you've supported each other through the series. Uh, and for all of my fellow pursuers of happiness, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that we made it. Now, just because we made it through a, a five-week series that uh, most of us, I think, have enjoyed doesn't mean uh, that pursuing happiness is over. I think we know that. Uh, this is a constant pursuit. Um, it takes a lot of work and diligence to, to continue to pursue and hold on to um, the peace that God gives us, uh, the peace that we're supposed to have and live out as a Christian. So I do want to encourage you to purchase a bookmark, or find a bookmark, or use these as a bookmark and place them in this letter in your Bible so that whenever you get worried or stressed or you get sad, or you become unhappy, go back to this letter. It is the happiest book in the Bible, the book of Philippians. So this morning we sort of conclude. Now there's more to it, but five weeks uh, is a good long time, and it's, it's time to... to uh, to switch gears a little. So we're, we're skipping. I don't know if you realize this, but at chapter 3 we didn't even touch. There is still a lot to be learned from this letter. But we move now towards the end of the book. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. And this morning, what we're going to find is that the teaching in this passage, chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 13, 13, show us how to avoid stressing out. Uh, if, if you've ever wanted to know how not to be stressed, keep the notes from this morning. They will be very helpful. So, one, and these points, there are four, they're sort of uh, paired up. And as we make our way through the message, you'll, you'll see how that works. First, uh, to avoid being stressed out, give nothing to worry. Give nothing to worry. Chapter 4, verse 6, don't worry about anything. Now remember, worry is a choice. Don't worry about anything. This morning I want to do a little test. These are not, this is not my test. It's a test I got from uh, doctors and psychologists who test um, people's worry. Uh, there's actually a test to find out your level of worry. I'm going to actually give you that test, part of that test, this morning. So, what I would ask you to do is just sort of listen to the statements. Uh, I've, got, I've got a few sentences to give to you. With each one, rate the statement... Uh, based on your level of worry, give it like one through three, right? So the first one would be, yeah, that's, that's me. I worry about that. The second one is, 
Oh yes, I, I worry about that one. And then the third level would be, oh my, that's me every day. So something like that. Three levels of your um, agreement with these statements. So if you need to close your eyes and just listen to the statements, this is a test that uh, counselors will give on to gauge your level of worry. Here we go. I worry that my family will be angry with me or disappointed with something that I've done. Gauge your level of worry. I worry that I am unattractive. I worry that I will lose close friends. I worry that I am not loved. I worry that I lack confidence. I worry that I might make myself look stupid. I worry that I'll never achieve my ambitions. I worry that I haven't achieved much. I worry that I don't work hard enough. I worry that I will be late for an appointment. I worry that I will make mistakes. I worry that my money will run out. I worry that my financial problems will restrict holiday or travel. I worry that I am not able to afford things. Test is over. How'd you do? If you were sort of number two or number three to two or more of those, your level of worry is is reaching the high mark. If it was over three of those or more, you have a high level of worry, stress, and anxiety. Now, I didn't need to give you the test for you to realize that we all deal with stress and worry and anxiety in life, and I don't even need to tell you these next things about the dangers of excessive worry, but I think it is important for us to realize what we're up against, because the more we remind ourselves, it seems like I don't know if we forget it, or if we're just not listening, or not paying attention, but we all worry. And I worry, we worry too much. I worry, we worry, okay, Carson got that. <laughs> the dangers of excessive worrying. Heart problems, you knew this. Too much worrying can lead to or worsen a heart issue. Sleep problems. You realize insomnia is tied to worry, anxiety, and stress. If you're not sleeping, we're worrying too much. All anxiety disorders. That's the third. All anxiety disorders. This one I did not know. They've changed the books for psychologists and psychiatrists, and it now includes, or it now has, that worry is the cardinal feature of all anxiety disorders. It, it's like pride and the seven deadly sins. Pride is the root of all of those deadly sins. Worry is the root of all anxiety disorders. If, you, if you're creeping up in that worry test, you're running a risk of having an anxiety disorder. Now, I didn't know this either. Do you know where worry comes from? Psychologists tell us that worry comes from a desire to control. A desire to control. Who would have thought? But if you think about it, think about what you worry about. It is worrying about the future and a desire to control that which has not yet happened or that is what you're afraid is going to happen. It's a desire to control. That's why we worry. That's why we have anxiety. And that's a big part of why we stress. Jesus knew this, which is why he spent a lot of time in his Sermon on the Mount in covering worry and why we shouldn't worry and why it's important not to worry. And in Matthew chapter 6, 
He said, do not worry or be anxious about the future. For your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first, so this is the key, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now there's a clue into how we detach ourselves from worry and stress, and that brings us to the second point. So the first is, give nothing to worry. The second, give everything to God. Give everything to God. Don't worry about anything, chapter 4, verse 6 says, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and give Him thanks for all that He has done. Notice how God wants us to deal with the stress in our life. Give nothing to worry and give everything to Him. He wishes to be first in our life. The most important, the priority in our life. Prayer is the most important weapon we have against stress and against worry. Prayer is your number one weapon against stress. You know those nights when you're laying in bed and you're unable to go to sleep because you're worrying about something and you're rolling it through your head, the scenario through your head, and you're talking to yourself? We would do better. This verse says, if we would talk to ourselves less and talk to God more. But how often do we lay awake at night talking to ourselves when this verse is very clear and Jesus is very clear? See, first, the kingdom of God. Bring everything to God and give nothing over to worry. Third, set your mind to good things. Set your mind to good things. Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Now that's a very wonderful verse. If you don't have a life verse, this might be one you could adopt for a while or a season. I mean, life verses can come or go. I've known some people who've kept the same verse all their life. But verses can come or go if you're in a season where you need to be reminded to think about good things. Adopt this as your verse. Memorize it. And when something negative starts coming in, Quote it to yourself. The verses make it clear that the battle over stress is won in our mind. It's won up here. So the greatest weapon is prayer, but the battle will actually be won in our minds. Worry is a mental thing. It's, it's something that we, we think we've got to control. It's something we think we need to be stressed out about or be anxious about. So the battle is won in our minds. Now there are two ways to apply uh, this verse. But before we apply it, um, for those that remember the sermon that... It's been months ago. I had a sermon called Worry in a Rocking Chair. And it looked at the uh, similarities between worry and a rocking chair, how they're very similar. One of the points in that sermon was that worry, much like a rocking chair, will give you something to do, but it will get you absolutely nowhere. Do you remember that point? If you think, of, they did a study on people sitting in a rocking chair versus people sitting in a regular chair for three hours, and at the end of the three hours, the person in the rocking chair burned more calories. But at the end of the three hours, they were both sitting in the same place. It gives you something to do, and it will burn your energy, and it will burn your time, and it will even burn your resources. But at the end of the day, you have accomplished absolutely nothing by worrying. In that way, it's very similar to a rocking chair. Now that ties in with this point. There are two ways to apply verse 8. And I'm not sure how 
Paul wanted us to apply them, and I'm not sure how we're supposed to, and it may be that you can apply it in both ways, but one way to apply verse 8 to your life is to use it as a stress test. Just use verse 8 as a test. Basically, the way you would do this is whatever you're worrying about or stressing about, take it and then take the characteristics in verse 8 and see if, see if they meet. See if it passes. And if, if what you're worrying about passes, then I guess you can continue to worry about it. But if it doesn't, for example, if it's not true, if it's not noble, if it's not right, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if it's not admirable, if it's not excellent or praiseworthy, then it's failed the stress test. Stop stressing about it and give it to God. But if it can meet these criteria, then praise be to God. But I doubt that it will. So the one, we could use it as a, as a stress test. The second is to realize that God is what's described in verse 8. If you think about this list of Characteristics in these traits, it is God. Paul is saying in a different sort of way, think about God. You can put at the beginning of this statement, to worship God is true, it is noble, it is right, it is pure, it is lovely, it is admirable, it is excellent, and it is praiseworthy, and that verse will still be true. To worship God is all of these things. So, maybe the next time we worry, we can either do the stress test with this verse or realize that we just need to be thinking about God more, and that leads us to our last point. We are to set our minds to good things, and number four, we're to set our life to His care. Set our life to His care. Paul says at the very end of this letter, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. So he's learned the secret of being happy. What is it? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Uh, the Ten Boom family. Most of us know that name. It's attached with Corey at the front of it. This was a family during World War II that lived in the Netherlands, 1940s. Uh, very devout Christian family. Nazis moved into their community, into their village, into their, into their town. And the Jewish men and boys began disappearing. Once the family, the Ten Boom family, realized what was going on, they took their Jewish neighbors into their home and hid them. One day they got a knock on the door. It was a nice-dressed lady. She had her suitcase with her. She had a, a look of panic. She said, my husband has been taken. My son has run away. And I'm afraid they're going to take me next. I'm Jewish. Will you, will you hide me? So the family took her in, and that began a long season of hiding Jews in their community. It's estimated that uh, this family saved over 800 uh, Jews, hid them in their homes, eight or nine at a time, until they could get them out of, of the town. They were betrayed by someone in the community. Uh, one evening, Nazi soldiers knocked on the door. Actually, they just raided the house. They found the hiding place. They arrested all the family members. M you remember the story. They all went to either jail or a concentration camp. At the end of the year, Corey was the only one left. And Corey Ten Boom, from then on for several years, was asked by several governments to receive just sort of a blessing, a token of our appreciation for what your family did for your neighbor, for those in your area. 
Now, this is a wonderful example. The reason I mention that, it's a wonderful example of a family who has completely set their lives into God's hands, God's care. And if you need a book this summer to read, you might pick up The Hiding Place. It's Corey Ten Boone's uh, famous, or most famous work. It might help you put your worry and anxiety into perspective to read about hers. Um, but it's also a wonderful example of a family who's figured out how to put our life in God's hands. She gives wonderful quotes. I want to give three of her quotes this morning as we close. These are quotes on worry. She said, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't change anything about tomorrow. It simply robs you of the joy of today. Second, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And my favorite quote, If you look at the world, you will be distressed. Looking at the world makes things worse. It will actually stress you out. Makes you distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. So you begin to internalize the things of the world, and it'll eat you up, and you'll get depressed. But if you look at God, you'll be at rest. Corey Ten Boom. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look to God, you'll be at rest. You'll be at peace. You'll be happy. My hope and prayer and encouragement is that as we move, as you move, through this week and through this summer, that you will continue not only to pursue happiness, but you will find it. And you will be able to hold on to it. And my prayer and encouragement is that you won't let it go. God has for us wonderful plans. He has for you a future and a plan and a purpose. And I am convinced that part of that is being happy and at peace. Give nothing to worry. Give everything to God. Set your mind to good things and set your life to his care. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather in worship and in witness and in learning. Lord, we ask that as we come before you this morning and come before this table that's been prepared for us, that you would be with our hearts, our minds, that you would go with us um, through the rest of this service, that you would forgive us of our sins that you would prepare us to be holy and sanctified before you, that we may live according to your will. Lord, be with us now and bless these elements of bread and juice, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world redeemed uh, for your service. In Jesus Christ, we offer this prayer and this blessing. We close this prayer being mindful of the words that your Son taught us to pray as we join together. Our Father, who art in heaven.